Hello, this is Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries in New Brunswick. Uh, today's session, we're going to focus on Shiny. And Shiny is a tool for interactive data visualization. So as in the past, I'm going to, or in other workshops in this series, I'm going to focus on material that is available from linked from the LibGuides site, libguides.rutgers.edu slash data underscore R. The code, or really the sample material that we're going to look at lives at my GitHub site, github.com slash Ryan data slash tidyverse approach, tidyverse underscore approach, to be correct. And um, if you're not using your own local RStudio installation, um, you could use rstudio.cloud to create a login and have free access um, for a certain amount of time to um, a, a web-based environment for rstudio. Uh, unlike other uh, sessions in the past, this session really is going to be more rstudio focused because rstudio has the tools that you need to really easily work with and test your Shiny environment. Um, you can always work in um, other coding environments, uh, but those are going to be much easier if you actually have access to a Shiny server um, to test things. If you don't have a Shiny server, and we'll talk about that in a bit, what that is, uh, you probably need RStudio to test your Shiny application. All right, so I'm going to start, uh, this is the this, this shiny.rstudio.com site. Um, shiny is an RStudio product developed by RStudio. Um, like other RStudio products, they release an open source version and a commercial paid support version um, that has some different uh, features to it. So in the first couple of segments of this series, I'm really going to talk more about shiny what it what it is how you can work with it i'm going to demo a little bit of the basic functionality and then later on we're going to develop a, a final part to this series that goes into more depth about creating a shiny um, application from scratch that's a little bit more than a basic example but to start with i'm going to go to my github site and i'm going, going to go to the page R for interactivity with shiny.md. Um, now you could also load the HTML page in a different um, window, but the .md file, the markdown file, displays quite nicely in uh, within the GitHub frame itself. So this is all we really need. I've clicked on R for interactivity with shiny.md, and this is a collection of the, some of the links that I'm going to talk through. So this first part is really much less coding, than, and, and we're not going to work through defined sample code. I'm going to show you some built-in examples when we get to the coding part. Um, so we've seen this site, shiny.rstudio.com. To get an idea of what Shiny is capable of, why are we saying Shiny, Shiny, Shiny? Uh, I'm going to go to the gallery, which is an illustration of the... Um, some interesting sites that have been developed by others. Uh, what Shiny does is it lets you develop an interactive website to display data, to allow the user to select, modify the, the, the data and the parameters that they're interested in. And to do that by still maintaining a, you know, an R framework without having to have a lot of knowledge beyond R itself, we can build a web page without having to go into JavaScript, without having to go into other tools, um, that it is certainly possible to develop interactive data websites uh, with lots of other technology. Um, but Shiny is a great starter kit that is is pretty powerful. It's, um, it's a strong tool for as a starter kit. So 
this page, the gallery, highlights um, different projects that people have done. I'm just going to show a couple from the life sciences. I'm going to show the COVID tracker, um, and I'm going to show this hospital data dashboard. Um, so once we open these up, you can see that it actually loads in, for the most part, it's going to attempt to load the application in the browser. Uh, we have some links that we could go more directly to get a full screen view. Um, but you can see that this is a functional mapping tool that has um, information about all the countries of the world, the number of um, COVID cases, COVID deaths. Um, we can see the countries that have been successful in suppressing any outbreak. Um, you can see Mongolia with three cases in the last 24 hours uh, compared to the United States with 44,614 cases in the last 24 hours at the time of this recording. Um, the map is shaded according to the number of deaths. Uh, we can get cumulative statistics if we click down in the bottom right. So if I want to see cumulative, um, that's actually not giving me the same mouse over functionality, but the, sh the shading, um, I believe, is going to reflect that. I haven't played with all the features here, um, but it is interactive. Uh, we can choose the mapping date, right? So we can actually uh, take a look at cases as of a certain date and we can also play the map over time um, so this is you know the kind of thing that you would find on other websites uh, but it has been developed completely using the shiny application and now we can see the number of cases sort of increasing over time day by day um, in this time lapse view Notice there are also other features up on the top where we can look at information in a specific region, access different kinds of graphs, uh, select our outcomes. And so this is this is what we mean when we have interactive data display. We the, the, the user of the site can actually delve in and explore and investigate their own ideas about the data much more effectively with this kind of site. And we can present much more complex um, data sets and allow people to draw comparisons. Um, here's an outbreak comparison uh, tool and there's links to information about the data sources um, which we can download and information about the site. So it's, it's a, it's a full-featured um, tool and the great thing about the Shiny Gallery is that most of your projects here will actually share the code, right? So here's a GitHub site that has the complete code for that, um, that interactive display. And I want to point out here, because we're going to see one of these in a moment, the app.r file is the core. This is the, that, that app is really the thing that is driving the display. Now this is a 1,000 line app, right? Because this is a full featured um, tool, but you know, a thousand lines is not insurmountable. Um, and it is, you, you can kind of get a flavor of the code here of what, it, what you would need to, to create a very full featured site with a rich amount of data uh, that's very customizable. Um, but a thousand lines of code is something that could be developed um, over, you know, maybe a, a couple of months of hard work. Um, so we're going to see simpler apps, app.r files that that create uh, shiny pages in just a moment. But again, I want to emphasize: if you go to the gallery, you see something that you really like, you can take a look at the code and figure out how it works. You can model some examples off of that, and it's a really great tool. So this one, uh, the second one I'm going to show you, uh, large hospital data, 
Uh, this is called uh, the radar um, tool. And this is just an example of a pure sort of dashboard approach. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about dashboards. Um, I'm just going to close that out. A dashboard is um, a display that lets you see and compare multiple elements of data um, according to your own preferences. Like that, the, the design is there to present the data that you need up front. Um, and you can see that this one has starts with a few default panels, um, number of patients, number of patients per year, number of admissions by different categories of medicine. So this is the patients tab. And if we want to change what we're looking at, um, we not we have some customization options just of the graph itself. So you know that's one thing we can look at. We can also filter the data. Uh, so if we're just interested in the few most recent years, we could update the data display like that. If we're interested just in uh, a particular area of medicine, let's say we're just interested in the surgery categories, so we're gonna uncheck other things. And we have all the other filters here. I won't go through the whole thing, but once I've selected some filters and click start, it's going to update the display. And now we have um, just those surgical numbers, just the numbers for the last three years. Um, and we've simplified that display. Uh, we also have these four tabs across the top. So if we don't want to look at patients, we want to look at other things antimicrobials, uh, diagnostics, right? We can just click and we get a quick view of relevant graphs for that, um, that category. So, you know, you can design these, of course, for many different purposes, um, but the idea of the dashboard is just this, that they are, they are panels. Each panel has some relevant data, uh, but embedded in the idea of dashboard is that there is interactivity. The user can select what they need and quickly get to the, the graphs they like. So once again, we can see the code. Um, again, it's very typical for these to be distributed via a GitHub site. And this site has a different structure. It has a server and a UI file, two files that generate the, um, the interactive Shiny app, along with a global file that is used for system-wide settings, the settings that apply across the board, um, like which packages are used, which data is used. So this is a global file, 180 lines. The server file is the, the real thing that drives the data analysis. This one's almost 3,000 lines. So there's a lot of uh, a lot more going on behind the scenes here than there was in the um, in the COVID case. And then the UI is the thing that defines the look and feel of what we're looking at. And that's only 387 lines here. So that is, um, again, relatively compact when you think about all the things that are going on. Okay, so, you know, those are full featured examples of Shiny in action. I want to emphasize that it is powerful. It can get a lot of things done uh, because the examples we're going to look at are much smaller. They're sort of toy examples. Uh, but keep in mind that you can build from those basic building blocks into much uh, more developed things like this. Okay, so just a couple, of, so those were uh, more heavy duty examples. I'm gonna show you a, a couple of more examples to just emphasize the capability here. Uh, one is this explore ggplot with Shiny, and a second is college scorecard data um, this explored ggplot with Shiny um, is, let's click on the link to actually launch the full app. May take a moment to load this up. So this is a site that lets us pick. Uh, I, if you remember our earlier session on ggplot2, I was talking about how many uh, geometries and views that we could use with ggplot. Well, here are many of them, and we can choose one just by clicking on it. And 
see an example and get some things to play with, right? So this is an easy interactive way to get into the um, nuts and bolts of ggplot. Uh, alpha affects the shading, the transparency of the elements. We can change colors. We can change line types. And I believe those are just the borders there. And we can change the size of the border lines, right? So now we've got a little bit of a different look and feel. And we can play around with a few of those elements. Once we're done, we can say, hey, let's show the ggplot function. So this would actually show us how to create a graph similar to this. Um, you know, now this is not a, you know, everything you're going to need to know about ggplot to use it, but it's an example of an interactive site with a slightly different purpose, with the sort of easy learning purpose um, to generate, view, generate, and mo view, modify, and generate various different uh, graphs, and then see the code that was used to generate them. So that's yet another example of a shiny app. And I include this one, this college scoreboard data, because this is a little bit simpler and it shows the code side by side with the, um, the app itself. Um, this is something that was done um, out of Amherst College in order to compare majors over time at several different sort of similar colleges. Um, so the interactivity here is that we can check off multiple um, schools. And they will also plot on the graph. We can change the, the variable that we're interested in. If we were interested in history majors rather than math majors, um, we can click that and our graph will update. So all we have here is just this one graph, um, just a few options. And the code, therefore, is much simpler than those big examples that we saw. Um, the code is divided, and we'll talk about this again in a bit more detail in just a second, but a server file that works with the data and a user interface file, UI file, that controls the look and feel here. So you can see that the UI is actually quite short, quite simple. Uh, the server file is a little bit longer, but this is primarily because um, of these sequence of commands to plot each of the different um, majors. So it's actually a, a simple example, um, but with some meaningful, you know, relevant data. Uh, one that's more relevant uh, to me personally is something that I worked on to develop. I don't have any, again, any claims that this is a great app, but this is an app that compares librarian staffing levels across Big Ten libraries. Um, and I've hosted it on shinyapps.io. And uh, you'll also notice that the, the, the graph automatically rescales itself. As I zoom in, it redraws the graph to fit the screen. Um, and so these are the total number of librarians. This data is a couple of years old. It, it's not, um, uh, not quite up to date, so just a little caution there. Uh, but you can visit this site. You can see the number of librarians. Um, you can see the number of librarians by category of field of specialty for the librarians. And you can also see the numbers sort of corrected by the number uh, in a per capita sense of the number, number of librarians per faculty member. Um, and the idea of this project was to see where Rutgers stands compared to some of its peer Big Ten institutions. Um, and, you know, typically when you look at these comparisons, we are not near the top, uh, but we are never quite at the bottom either. So there's uh, something to be said for that. Um, so my point in showing you this one, I don't have the code displayed here on the site, but if I can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> That's my moral of that story. All right, so I'm going to return after we work through actual shiny examples to some of these other links. 
Uh, but I, I like to take some time to talk about, we've, we've seen the results of Shiny. Um, let's talk about how we create uh, a Shiny app. Now this we can also see via the gallery link and the, sh the Shiny demos here, not the user showcase, which are the big full featured sites, but the Shiny demos are very simple, uh, straightforward um, applications. So I'm going to look at the first one here on the website, and then I'm going to show you in the RStudio app what one of these looks like. So here's uh, K-Means. K-Means is a clustering technique, um, and this iris data is a, is a very common example used in hundreds of sort of introductory examples. I apologize if you're sick of the iris data, um, but that's what this is. So we have clustering going on in this graph. Uh, we can cluster on different characteristics. So in, this is a data set about flowers, about irises. And so the measurements are measurements of the flowers themselves. Um, so if I change from sepal width, obviously if I, if I am plotting sepal width against sepal width, that's not a terribly interesting uh, uh, couple of groupings. But let me do sepal width versus petal width. And the data itself will cluster, um, meaning it, it groups itself into three groups. We've actually specified the number of clusters, three groups. And the, the ones that are most similar to each other when we split it into three groups are these red, blue, and green uh, categories with the X marking the centroid of the cluster. Now, it's interactive, right? So we can have additional we can specify more clusters. There's 10, uh, 20. When you, like by the time you get to 20, you've got very few points for each one. But you know there are some differences that you can observe. Like if I cluster into groups of four, um, there's this one huge group, and there are these three other groups. At least when I'm looking for sepal width versus petal width. Anyway, so you can. This is not about clustering. Uh, it's about the interactivity of the graph. We can see the graph is interactive. We make some changes and boom, the uh, graph redraws. How is that graph drawn? Uh, again, you have to think of two parts, right, that cycle into each other. They loop um, back and forth to each other. So there's a server side. The server side is the side that is most similar to just base R. If, so if you think of the server as running the statistics, doing the data analysis, generating the graph. And we can see that that part, uh, when we get right down into this um, section, right, we have just a standard plot command um, that plots the data and points Uh, according to our um, our parameters. And so the core of this is an R plotting function. And how does the, let's walk through how this server file works. All right, so we start with something called selected data. We're going to grab something called selected data and it is a reactive function. I'm going to also talk more about reactivity in a minute. But uh, what it's doing is grabbing the data from the iris data set according to these inputs. So the input of which X column to use and which Y column to use. Now, the, calling this reactive is saying that we're expecting this particular element to change based on user input. So the, the Shiny server is looking out for it. It's looking out for changes. And when the changes are made, it's going to update the information in the graph. Um, this is an important concept in Shiny. So then we specify the clusters. This is also reactive because once the selected data 
changes and the number of clusters change, um, it's going to recompute. Right, so here is our basic k-means statement, right? So that we're, this is where the computation happens to figure out what are the clusters. And the k-means are based on the selected data and the number of clusters. So notice this is also an input. Then we have a, a net, another section, which is output. So the output dollar sign plot one is that's our name for this plot. We're calling it plot one. And it's going to be generated by a sort of master function. That's, this is the shiny part of what's going on. Shiny has these master functions like render plot that within the, within the brackets, the parentheses and brackets of the function, all of the, the work is going on, but it renders and fits it into the right area of the screen for us. So this custom palette, that's not very important. That's just actually specifying the colors of the dots and things. Um, and the, it, this one is a little fussy. It specifies the, the margins and how it's going to fit into that uh, available space. But the plot command itself, as we saw, is the is the thing that's really happening. That's just an rplot command. It works with the selected data and it plots the clusters according to dollar sign cluster, so the number of clusters. Um, and the clusters dollar sign center centers um, is something that comes from the k-means process. All right, so the, the key here, right, is we have an input and an output. Uh, the output, we see how it's been generated. The input, we actually haven't seen it in code where it comes in. We can guess, right, that the input is coming from this part of the panel, but the input is actually coming from the user interface, right? This is the user interface, right? So on the, the UI side, uh, we have the user interface is defined. So the vars, um, that's simply to um, collect the correct names for use in these um, in these select selections. Um, we have a very simple command to de define this page with sidebar. So this is where you know Shiny's doing the work for you of formatting the web page and putting it in a pleasing orientation and a nice uh, balanced columns and things like that. That's what page with sidebar does. We've got a page. Here's the sidebar. Uh, the header panel is the name that we see up top. The sidebar panel is where we define what is going on in the sidebar. And we have these very straightforward functions, select input, which we select from among the vars. Right, so those are the vars that we just defined, which are the names of the elements of the iris data set. And another select input for the y variable. And then numeric input so that we can choose a number that's going to be the number of clusters. Okay, so notice input is not specified over here, but the names of these variables are the same. The x call appears again on the server side as input dollar sign x call, input dollar sign clusters, right? So anything that's that's coming in through those input functions is automatically put in this object called input, and then it's input dollar sign variable name when you want to refer to it. Uh, and the same thing here, this final piece is that the main panel is going to be filled with something called plot output. So it's going to plot some output. What is the output that it's going to plot? Well, it's called plot one. And that name specifically refers to the thing that was generated on the server side, output dollar sign plot one. So that name has to match. Um, it's, and we always use input and output we always use server and UI. You don't want to um, really mess around with, there's no gain in messing around with modifying those names because that's what Shiny expects. 
Uh, that's what the functions expect. And you, you just want to go with that. <laughs> um, even if it's technically possible to modify those, um, work with input and output and server and UI. Now you'll notice this whole server um, statement is bracketed with this function. Uh, that's just kind of setting up the entire system, right? The fu it's a function of inputs and outputs and um, the session information. I'm not even sure what that does in this particular case, but you know, the, it has a defined format. The tricky part about actually building a working Shiny app is, uh, you know, it's we've got a lot of parentheses and brackets going on because of these sort of nested elements. You have to get those correct. You have to make sure that the dynamic elements are reacting in the way you hope. And that's what this reactive statement helps you accomplish. Um, and, you know, beyond that, it may be a question of getting familiar with um, specific syntax elements. Okay, we've walked through this web example. So I'm going to take a little deep breath here, take a breath, stretch, and we'll look at this same concept but in our studio. How do we actually write uh, an app? So our studio is great because it has these tools that help you do that. So I can go into our studio. Uh, once again, I, I have my RStudio defaulted to this kind of dark background. Just my preference. Yours probably looks different with the light background. Um, and I'm just going to say new, um, new file. And you'll notice one of my options for a new file, if I can mouse it over correctly. It's, that's a long way to go to the right um, with very little margin for error. Okay, now, um, and I'll select Shiny Web App. Okay, so I'm going to give it a name. I'll just say like Demo 3. I think I have some other demo files in my directory. That's why I want to say Demo 3. And I will choose the multiple file type to start because that's similar to what we were just looking at. And I'll say Create. Now what Shiny will do for you or our studio in this case will do for you is it gives you a working app to start with. Um, it, it, it gives you this working example that you can then start understanding and modifying. I can prove that it's working because in our studio when I have an app I can say run app and it will actually launch it and run it um, directly from our studio. This is a very simple one. It's a histogram and the only interactive part is that we can adjust the number of bins, the number of, you know, basically bars that the histogram divides the data into. And I can just modify that. Now this is running in a local browser. You can see the, um, the address. If we want to see it actually in a browser, we can click the option to open in a browser. And it's basically the same thing uh, when you're testing. You know, I, the expectation is that your users are going to see it in the browser ultimately. So it's good to um, optimize the look and feel for this type of format. Okay, now I'm going to close that so we can look at the code. Um, you'll notice when I ran it, it says listening on that port. So it's got a local port that it runs the Shiny server off of, um, sort of temporarily. I'll talk about some of the server issues in just a moment. So we have, um, like before, we have a user interface file and we have a server file. Um, the a, a Shiny application lives in a particular directory. So when I said create that um, demo three, what it did was, did it put it in my, it just put it in my uh, home folder in this case. I didn't set my default directory correctly. Um, so I have a folder called demo three and in that folder lives the server file, lives the UI file. 
And if we have data that we want to have available along with the app, it would also live in this directory. So we could put a CSV file there with our data, things like that. So here's library shiny, right? Let, let's just walk through this code and see what happens, right? So we load the sh load shiny. We define the user interface. So that is defined with the statement shiny UI. And fluid page is just a way of specifying a page that dy dynamically reacts to, you know, the size of the browser, the inputs that are going on. And then we get into, you know, pretty understandable things. Title panel, old faithful geyser data. And we, since we're now in our studio, we can edit this, right? So we can, just to prove that we can get a change, new unfaithful geyser data. Um, we can, uh, the next segment is the sidebar layout. Um, so, and then there's a sidebar panel and slider input for the bins or number of bins. Um, we can change this to, let's say, minimum of 20, maximum of 100. And the value is the default value that it starts at. It's probably always a good idea to set that um, to something reasonable, uh, maybe the you know the middle of the data range, um, just so that users when they launch something it starts out with reasonable behavior. So this is all you know editable, and then we can show the plot. So the main panel contains plot output, and it contains something called dist plot. All right, so I'm just going to run this again just to show you that my changes did take effect. Uh, you will get this little warning, right? If you because I made some changes, but I didn't save them, and I should have. So I'm going to say save selected, and now here's my new unfaithful geyser data with bins up to 100, which looks a little odd, um, and I you know I can again adjust those. You notice how it just immediately sort of updates the um, histogram. Okay, this is the server side. So what I would expect if we, we think about what we saw before is that on, I'm sorry, this is the user interface file, is that on the server side, we should see these bins and number of bins as inputs. And we should see the output as being dist plot. Now I'll say, uh, actually, it's only bins that's the input here. Number of bins is what displays in the sidebar, the, the human readable part. So if I say, enter your bins, um, you know, the, that's the, the displayable part here where it says, enter your bins. But the actual variable name is the first one listed is bins. Okay, so I'll go over to the server file. And again, this is the same files. If, if when you go and click start a new shiny app, file new shiny app, um, you'll see these files. So you can get in and play with them yourselves. We once again, it's safer to, to do this to say library shiny because um, we do need that available for sure on both sides. We're now defining the server, shiny server, and it's a function of input and output. And the output is defined by this function. The output is going to be that dist plot. And we're going to render the plot. This is a shiny specific function. Now inside here, this is basically just R. Um, so we're going to take two things, x and bins. So x is just our data, right? This is just, we're, we're extracting one column from the old faithful data set that's part of R. And we're calling it x. And the bins is going to be uh, up through input dollar sign bins, the number of bins that we've picked. So that this is, is necessary just the way the histogram function works, is if I say I need 50, 50 bins, it's going to have to generate 
um, elements from the um, the low point of the data up to 50, right? Or I mean, across the whole range of data, but sliced into 50 pieces. And here's just the histogram function. So the, it's a histogram of X, which is our raw data. And the number of breaks in the data is the number of bins as created by this, um, this function, which includes the input dollar sign bins. And we can specify, you know, the color there, right? So if I just change the, the colors, just so you can see that it does have an effect. I'll save it first, run it. We get a, a more fluorescent uh, histogram. Again, just to emphasize that the names of the variables have to be the same on each side. If I change the name of the plot and I change the name of the input from bins, oh, let me call it cans instead of bins. And I try to run that application. I will, it will create my user interface, but my output is missing because it, it was, it failed to find anything called displot2. Um, and it's also going to have trouble with this one. One of the real problems, uh, problem is, is maybe a, a big word to use, but it, it's a bit challenging and shiny. Uh, sometimes to find out what's going wrong, right? When you, you notice that in that case, um, the the application clearly doesn't work, but it's not throwing a, an obvious error about what's happening. So you have to be very careful as you build it um, that you understand what's going on, what's interacting with what, and you know I think that's that's an important part of the shiny development because it. Um, it can be tricky to find out um, what's wrong. So we um, changed the name of displot to displot2. So one thing we can fix is we can go onto the user interface side and we can say plot displot2 instead of displot. Let's run the app now. Okay, now it actually found a plot but it generated an error because we don't have the correct input coming in. We, we were looking for something called cans and we don't have it. Again, the error is a bit cryptic, right? Um, that error statement is not clearly linked to what we need to do to fix this. So that's part of your learning about Shiny is dealing with these things. Okay, so, but I do know that in this case, I need to rename my input variable from bins to cans on line 21. And I'm hoping that'll be enough to fix everything. Let's try it out. We'll run it. And yes, now it's working again. Um, it still says enter your bins. Notice we didn't change the human readable text. We just changed the underlying variable. All right, so this is basically um, how things work. Uh, we can create an additional file if we uh, that can can work with this um, sorry um, Dig into all that. Um, I'm going to save it in that same demo three uh, folder. And the global file can house things that are just going to run in general. And so I can actually take something like the library shiny command out of the individual UI and, and uh, global files and leave it in the 
take it out of UI and server and leave it in global. And that should work because it should run the global file first and then look at the user interface and server. Uh, so some of your settings, some of your loading of your data, your data processing might happen at the global file level. So this, this can be useful if this model of segmenting your app development works, works for you. If you like that, uh, you can use the UI plus server plus an optional global file. However, there's another way to build a shiny app, which is with a single file. And we call that file app.r. That's again, just the convention. It's always app.r. Um, probably better not to um, get fancy and try to change those names around because you're just going to confuse everyone else who's trying to use your, your material. So I'm going to create a new file, a new shiny web app. I'm going to call it demo four. And I am just creating it within my home directory. And I'm going to clear these other ones out so we we're not distracted by those. And you'll see that this is if I run the app, it is the same app, right? The result is the same. It's old faithful geyser data with interactive bins. But in this case, it's all in one long file. And we, if you, if you study the code, you'll see that the code is really, the, the running part of the code is the same, but we have a section for UI where we assign everything that would have um, been in the UI file just to some an object called UI. And then we have a server section where we assign everything that would have been in the server.r file to an object called server. And in order to invoke it or run it, we always are going to end this, um, this file with the statement shiny app UI equals UI server equals server. Now, so, you know, technically we can, we can change the names here, right? And I can say, I'm going to assign the serve part to be something called serve up. And so the server will be serve up instead of just server. And it will still run like that. But there's, again, little advantage to violating the conventions uh, just to leave it as server. Um, unless you had some reusable code chunks where you had server version one, server version two. I could imagine some cases where you might want to do that. But in general, it's going to be simpler for you if you just go with the flow and leave these as server um, as Shiny intended them to be. So if you remember the separate files, they started out by saying, um, by invoking the Shiny server for server.r or invoking the Shiny UI for ui.r but for app.r, the invocation to launch it comes at the end with this shiny app. Um, so obviously, like a single file is, is more compact. It's uh, perhaps clearer that everything goes together. But as your code gets longer, even just, you know, sort of finding where the server section is versus the UI section in the file itself, I think there's some advantages to splitting the splitting it into multiple files as your data gets larger. But you have it's completely your choice. There aren't any um, real differences here. Um, there's no need for a global R file in the single file version because essentially everything that you run up at the top is already global because you've just got one file. So that's, that's how this works. Now you can go into um, the into the um, 
shiny code and run example is a command that will allow you to access some several built-in simple examples of how shiny code works um, I'll leave those for you to play around with um, so if I say 06 tab tabs tab sets excuse me that will launch a, a different example um, with multiple outputs grouped by tabs and a similar kind of interactivity um, selection up at the top. So this is a slightly more complicated example, but you know it shows you the, the sample code. Um, so there's a lot to build off of here. Um, there's a lot at the RStudio site. Um, if you go to Shiny's Get Started, you'll see there's a whole tutorial um, sequence, two hours and 25 minutes long. And that will go into a lot more detail about some of these things that we are just introducing. You can learn from the site uh, via their reference. Uh, whoops, I didn't want upgrade notes. I want the function reference. And you can see all of this, the shiny functions here. So we've seen a few of those. There's not an, an, an overwhelming number, but you know the uh, different kinds of layouts, different kinds of um, panels you can create. So flow or split or vertical, um, different kinds of inputs like checkboxes and button radio buttons. Um, all those are available with their own little functions, and you can read about them on the site. So I encourage you to, uh, there are also you know, plenty of YouTube videos like this, this one. Um, there's lots of great content. There are many courses you can take from several different sources, but I think what's on the Shiny site itself is, is really, um, really great. So now I'm gonna return to our links. I'm gonna do two things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention some of these links and then I'm gonna talk about the Shiny server uh, process. What does it mean to have a Shiny server? How do you actually release your Shiny apps into the wild? Um, but let me start with the, the sort of miscellaneous other topics. So I mentioned reactivity. There's a link here uh, to Shiny's guide to reactivity. And I just emphasize this because this is a really important concept. You might find when you're building your app that something is not, you know, you're you're hitting that button, you're, you're adjusting the slider, and things are not happening the way you expect them to. And you need to think, in those cases where it's not working, you need to think carefully about uh, what Shiny receives first and what it then updates and make changes makes changes on so if you need like your data to recompute something after you after an input is changed um, that's you know a less simple kind of input than simply toggling between a couple of options um, and you may have to explicitly specify um, that the the element is reactive like we saw that reactive uh, statement in the the first code we looked at this this page will explain that in more detail and again you want to think about you know when I change this input it goes to this other step and then it induces these other changes you just want to understand that and make sure that it's carrying through your code correctly and so these concepts of reactive sources conductors and endpoints uh, may be necessary for you to learn in more detail to get your app working properly. Um, you can also modularize your code. There's a, this is the last link on the page. Um, modularization means that you can create reusable um, 
chunks of code. And this page talks about, you know, how to do that. Um, I'm not going to really even go there and talk any further about it. But if you've got something, you know, that's a more complex operation, but you, it's repetitive, you want to keep reusing it, you can modularize your code in this way. And then uh, finally, before we start talking about the servers, uh, is the Shiny dashboard uh, package. This is an add-on package. It's an extension to Shiny, but it is designed to give you a quick and easy toolkit to create a dashboard. So if, if the dashboard is what you want, uh, you can just grab this package and when you look at the functions here, um, you'll see that this package has its own uh, sort of quick functions to generate a layout, right? A row based layout, a column based layout, and then to plug in pieces into the dashboard with a lot less effort. And also, you know, with some care to make it a nice, uh, nice interface, the shiny dashboard package can do some of that work for you. So I highly recommend it if um, if a dashboard is something you think about creating in Shiny. Um, and let's go back to the top. So like some of the examples that they have here, um, streaming CRAN data are, you know, simple examples, but they are... Um, full dashboards with multiple um, components. Okay, so finally, let's talk about getting your shiny, your beautiful shiny interactive app out into the world. Um, so as we saw, shiny expects to run on a web server. Shiny can do that locally on your using your RStudio installation. But you, need, you want to get it out there, show it to someone else. You have a few options, one of which is shinyapps.io. Uh, this is a, is a site maintained by RStudio. It is free to get a small, low-use account. You can sign up and you can uh, get support for up to five running applications uh, with 25 hours per month of use. So little things that you are just testing out yourself or sharing with a small group of people, um, you'll probably be fine with that. And certainly you can learn how this, the, the Shiny um, environment works by um, playing with the free version of shinyapps.io. It is a paid service once you start to have more applications uh, or ones that generate significant web traffic. If the, if the app is up and running because people are hitting it on the web all the time, you're going to run out of your 25 hours fast. Um, so you should choose something unpopular like number of librarians <laughs> in, in university libraries. You won't have that problem if you, if you tried to do a COVID site uh, for free for 25 hours um, a month, you probably run out of that uh, free time. However, it's easy to use, and when you um, are in our studio, our studio has this button, this little blue icon is a publish button, and you can click publish and I'm actually not going to walk through this process. I do need to update some packages in order for this to work. Put, completing the publish operation, um, what it does is it essentially takes everything that's in your that particular directory. Uh, it does some validation and checking on it, and you know there's a little bit of behind the scenes processing that has to happen, which is what those additional packages are for. Um, before it can be sent uh, to a remote site. But RStudio will do that for you. 
and it will do that in a few different ways. Um, so you can publish it directly to Shiny Apps. Um, once you set it up, it's it's just really like a one-click thing where it pushes it to the Shiny Apps site. Once you've got your account login information stored in our studio, um, or you may be in a in a different environment, like in a corporate environment where someone your systems staff is maintaining the the R Studio server for you, and you can get a login there uh, that will allow you again with the one click publish to the the local site. So that's one way. Uh, you know, basically shiny apps or your local IT guru who is already taking care of our studio server for you. Uh, however, you might be curious, you might be interested in running our studio server yourself. And you can do that. Um, so again, from the R studio, the main R studio site, if I go to products, shiny server, this is the server version of shiny, right? So, and you should understand this, you know, that this is really what ultimately it depends on. If you want a fully functional version, uh, shinyapps.io is simply running our studio server in a large volume. Um, now you can download the open source shiny server and if you have a little bit of Linux experience setting up things like, you know, setting up a database and a web server on Linux, uh, you can probably walk through the steps to set up a Shiny server. It's, it's relatively straightforward, but it does require you to have um, a Linux platform to run your, your Shiny material off of. So you can you can set it up, configure it, and once it is configured, loading a particular app simply means putting the directory of files for that app up onto your server. So you would just um, you know SCP you know, do a file transfer to send your files to the server, or it may be your, it's just the machine that you're working on. Um, however you'd like to do that. If you have Shiny server running, uh, loading specific applications simply means putting them in, the, in a certain directory, just like you would put your web content in a public HTML directory. It's the same concept on Shiny server. And, uh, as I have some time, um, I'm going to actually try to do a video that's going to show you more about um, setting up, configuring uh, your, your own version of these things. So you can go uh, and you can Google for instructions um, that many of these web services, um, what, I, what I hope to show you in an upcoming video is um, a DigitalOcean example. Uh, you could do this on Amazon Web Services. Of course, all these require spending a little bit of money to at least to set up a demo example. Uh, but you can get a hosted instance and follow some relatively straightforward instructions um, to configure Shiny Server on, you know, a remote instance and then have that as your personal Shiny server that, that serves up material. So Shiny server is available. It is definitely possible to um, run it and install it on your own. Um, it is also possible that you might be in a more supported environment where you have access to someone doing these things. Um, but your three options for delivering Shiny apps to the world are first shinyapps.io, which is super easy, but might, might involve some cost. Uh, the second is if, you know, find someone who's got a Shiny server who can 
um, give you access to it, whether that's in a company or a particular research environment. The third is more of a do-it-yourself do approach where you um, run your own Shiny server on a web accessible machine. And as I said, so I'm going to stop here. That's a general introduction to Shiny. I hope it has shown you the the power of Shiny uh, that within a relatively simple framework, you can generate nice interactive applications, um, viewers for data, data exploration tools. And I will add to this sequence a video that is much more nuts and bolts uh, about building a more complex app from scratch uh, for those of you who are interested in that thing. And I'll also talk about um, these kind of server configuration issues. So thanks for listening. Um, that's the end of sort of the intro to Shiny video. And I wish you success in with your explorations of R and Shiny and data in general in the future.